On today's episode of Rocky Retirement, we talk with Maura Sweeney, a happiness expert who has been featured internationally and in over a hundred media outlets. And I've created a very special freebie just for you. It's the 10 podcast episodes to increase your happiness taken from Living Happy from the Inside Out podcast, which is hosted by Mara Sweeney. To get it, just go to rockyourretirement.com slash happiness. Now, without further ado, here is my conversation with Mora. Talking with people about how to have a great retirement. This is the Rock Your Retirement Show. We don't talk about money, but we talk about almost everything else you need to rock your retirement. Now, here's your host, Kathy Klein. Hi, this is Kathy, founder of Rock Your Retirement. I started this show because many baby boomers think that retirement is all about money, and it's not. Think about it. It's very difficult to go from spending 2,000 or more hours a year to doing nothing. For the first six months, it might be fun, but then you might hit a wall. Many divorces happen after retirement because the couple isn't used to spending so much time together. Depression can also set in. We want to help prevent that, so that's why I started this show. Our guest for today is Maura Sweeney, and Maura Sweeney is a happiness expert and next generation thought leader. She's an author, a podcaster, an international speaker, a Huffington Post contributor, a media guest with focus on influence, leadership, emotional intelligence, and personal and career branding. She's been featured in over a hundred media outlets, including the Tampa Bay Times, Match.com, Midlife Boulevard, BBC Radio, overseas TV shows, and more. So Maura, welcome to the show. Kathy, thank you. I'm thrilled to be on Rock Your Retirement today. So thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. So did that sum up what you do or tell me a little bit about what I didn't say? Well, you said a mouthful and I'm smiling even as I heard your introduction because I thought, imagine now your listenership is going to realize these are all things I did after my quote unquote retirement. And yet... Every bit of everything I do, I enjoy because it's all been in me my entire life waiting for an opportunity to give it some outlet. So no, I think you've covered all the bases. What I do is I provide content that comes out of my mind, out of my experiences, out of my learning, out of my travel. And I look to inspire other people in their own life path, wherever they are, to connect with what I would call their GPS to happiness. That is finding out what their value system would be like, what they enjoy, what their curiosities are all about, and help them to kind of go within, explore those things, and to step out and become the person that they really are from within. And in doing so, I feel like I'm meeting new friends. I'm doing what I love, which is the writing and the communicating. I'm meeting new people, and hopefully I'm contributing to a better and happier world. Mara, it sounds like you're a happiness expert. Would you categorize yourself as that as being a happiness expert? Well, let's say I'm a practiced happiness expert. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really start out this way. The joke was this. When I was a little girl, my grandmother, and we had lived with her after my grandfather passed away, um, she said, oh my goodness, Maura, I look at you. I want to give you a compliment or say something. And the next thing I know, you're crying. And she used to call me waterworks because I was always crying. I would cry at the drop of a hat. And so there I was as this young person who was probably very sensitive. And yet I remember making a decision that I would grow up to be happy. So I really think about happiness as an art form. And I think about it as a means of how we process whatever happens to us in life and how we see ourselves. So yes, by that uh, description, I would now call myself a happiness expert with years of experience. So you weren't happy as a little girl and you had to train yourself. Yes. And you know, not to say I was an unhappy child, but I think I was very much a free spirit, uh, Kathy. There were ways in which I saw the world, maybe things I wanted to do. And yet being a very compliant child and first child, I was brought up to be more kind of inside the box. And many of the things that I was trained to do wouldn't necessarily have been my choice. So I think to that degree where I didn't feel free, that was where the lack of happiness showed up. 
how did you figure it out? Like what finally made you think, oh, this is what I'm going to do? Well, I can't say it was such a quick and easy trip, but I do remember as a young child watching people around me who were older in years, and I was able to distinguish between those who were happy and those who were not. And what my little mind was able to show me is that people who felt free to be who they were within, who were following things, ideas, and lifestyles that spoke for them, and authentically so for them, tended to be the happiest and freest-minded people. And conversely, those who maybe got stuck somewhere, who did what they were supposed to do, who then painted themselves into corners as if they were living by someone else's standards or by experiences that came their way and that were kind of on the crabby side, I just thought to myself, well, when I get older, I I'm going to be a happy adult, meaning I will follow things that resonate within me that make me feel freely and authentically um, like a person who's living out what's real for them rather than maybe what society says. So here I was, this little free spirit at five years old in the early 60s, you know, making decisions like that. I have to say, it's kind of funny when I look at my life now to think that I've spent decades in that process of coming out of the box. And it could be sometimes they're societal boxes. Sometimes they are family boxes. Sometimes they're educational or economic boxes. It doesn't matter. But that's what I've spent my lifetime doing. And I love the fact that I can now share little life stories, share some of my own stories and talk about the places we could get stuck in life. And yet we could go back there, revisit those areas and come out with new perspectives and better feelings about who we are and where we want to go. This has been a lifelong project for you. So what made you decide to turn this into something that was more concrete rather than just talking to your friends, but actually starting the blog and writing the books and doing all the things that you're doing now? Why did you start this project? You know, I probably always, from the time I was very little, wanted to write and wanted to communicate. I really love people. I Like, see this right now? I'm talking to you. This thrills me to be able to connect with people and ideas. (laughs) And um, as a very little girl, I was actually always told I would be a lawyer. And that's part of my backstory. My family expected me to be a lawyer following in the footsteps of my late grandfather. And while I would be in his office as a young child, it wasn't law that attracted me, but it was the secretary that was there working on a typewriter. (laughs) Now, it wasn't that I wanted to be a secretary, but what I was drawn to, Kathy, was the written word that showed up in a formal document. Oh, I didn't even know how to read yet, but I remember sitting next to this woman's desk watching everything she did. It was an old uh, uh, standard typewriter, which she insists on using. non Right, which people in our demo would know, but you know, people in the <laughs> millennial demo wouldn't. But I would watch her do these legal documents in, in duplicate and triplicate, and all I could see was that she was doing something that was very important. And I made a connection as a young child that anything that could be the written word and placed in such a fashion that others would read it would be something that would garner attention, influence, and a certain amount of weightiness. Now, so here I am, look at this many years later. I'm also a publisher, writer, I'm a podcaster. So I find so many ways to get the word out there, but it's within today's technology. And yet here I was as a young child, so taken up with the power of the typewriter and the written word. And so I think I've spent my corporate background um, and many experiences since then working with the written word, reading a lot, practicing, and I just sort of took what I enjoyed and put it all together. And here I am, fortunately, in this era where we can become our own writer, and it really costs us almost nothing to do. And we can take our ideas like I have and share them with others out there that are either looking for the content or have a like-minded approach to, to life. That's fantastic. And did it really start growing after you retired or was it something else that expanded? When you were working, you 
always were working with the written word. I was. But when did you go into this for yourself? You know, in my case, um, my husband and I actually decided when our daughter was getting ready to go to college that we wanted to do something different with our lives. We had a computer company that was profitable, but not really purposeful. And we just thought, you know what, we were always wanting to do things, but we really were at a point in our life where we wanted to do something else and something different. So we ended up scaling back and I could remember as at this was really a, a time that things changed lying in bed at night and suddenly because I had a little extra time on my hands I was rethinking life stories and I'd be lying in bed laughing to myself and so I thought <laughs> I bet I'm not going to sleep so I better get up and I'll just get on the computer and I'll start writing and some of them were childhood stories some were f- just funny stories that made me laugh and I would share them with friends. And then a little after that, I started writing on some other blogs. At that point, Salon.com had some um, guest writers come in. And then later, I started up my own website. So it was little by little. Um, I can't say it happened all at once. I even wrote my book series. And it was a process for me, Kathy, probably like anyone in any field. For me, it was the idea of how do I take a lot of things because I was probably, as much as I'm a social person, I think a lot of my life was quite kind of closed vest. So in order to tell stories, I had to open myself up. So I went to writers groups and I just continued to practice, get feedback and exercise my craft. And um, so I just really took what I loved and kept doing it, which I guess would be advice I'd give to anyone who's looking for picking up a hobby or any other pursuit now that they're thinking about retirement. Do you have a degree in writing or what was your degree My background, I have a bachelor's in both political science because I was the supposed to be New Jersey lawyer. I had a second um, major in uh, Spanish literature. And then after that, I have half of a law degree. And that was when I decided I am so not happy going in this direction that I have been groomed for, which was to be a lawyer in New Jersey. And uh, so I have probably the more than what I need for a master's, but none of it uh, was official writing or journalism in my background, which only goes to show you don't always need to go the direct route to get where you want to go. <laughs> Right. It sounds like if somebody who is listening to this show wants to write, they don't have to go to college and get a a degree in writing. They just need to start practicing and get better and better at it. Right. I would agree, Kathy. I mean, there might be some people that want to be a brain surgeon. I think you have to go to school. For that. I would hope so. <laughs> but for writing, there are so many meetups and writers groups and people that you could go to that would be your family and friends that could be your listeners and your readers and your, your feedback people. But it would be like any other pursuit. If there's someone listening today and they may have had something that they were interested in but maybe never had the time for when they were working full time, now would be the time to say, you know what, I'm going to get my feet wet. I'm going to try. And a lot of people might think, oh gosh, I can't do it. Either I'm too old or I don't have the training. But like anything else, Kathy, we take what we like and what we have an interest in and we just continue to exercise it. And over the course of time, like anything, we become our own expert. Well, how many hours does it say you need to do something to become an expert? You know, I've read it's something like 10,000 hours. Did you hear that? Yeah, I think it's 10,000 hours. So if somebody wants to become an expert, they got to get started now. <laughs> I guess so. And do it in their sleep. But I think if we really love something, it won't even feel like work. It may feel like a challenge at times, you know, where we're coming over hurdles of things we didn't know before or new things that we have to acquire. But if we really have an interest in something and a curiosity, the more we apply ourselves to it, the better we will naturally become because the desire is within us to make it happen. And it actually becomes fun. Tell me about your work at the Huffington Post. Well, I, it's purely accidental. Some people have said to me, oh, how did you get onto the Huffington Post? When I started writing, Kathy, people looked at me as a blogger and they said, well, who is your demo or who's your avatar? And I said, well, anybody that wants to be happy. And they looked at me <laughs> as if there was something wrong with me because I wasn't following the rule book. And all I was doing, truly, I was 
doing this almost as my own experience because I knew life was changing. And I was really writing about the many changes that were going on in my life uh, at the time. And I was learning new things and stepping out into new venues and being a mom whose daughter went away to college. So there were a lot of new things. But here's the funny thing with Huffington Post. They wrote to me and offered me what appeared to be a portal where I could use my own name and I could submit my blogs as I had them. What I've since learned is that there are up to 30,000 people, I could say a week, people have said it's a day, that apply to be Huffington Post bloggers. But I would say I'm probably a good example of someone who just followed what they loved and eventually the world sort of made room. And that's really what I would say in Huffington. They were looking for someone who had positive or uplifting content, and I seem to fit the bill. Do you still work with them? I do. I submit whenever I have, I probably twice a month, even though on my own website I put in posts far more frequently. But I look for things that I feel the readership would appreciate, that would appeal to a greater demographic. And I sort of do a lot of what I do by sheer, I want to say like gut instinct. That makes sense. You were telling me before we started the interview, you were telling me a little bit about a cancer survivor at a book expo. So why don't you tell our audience about that? Yes, because you were asking me, were there any interesting stories or or connections that were made as a result of my writings? There were three that came to mind. One was last summer, I was invited to speak at book expo, their bloggers conference. And there were a lot of people at the group. And one man came out later on to say hello to me. He was a professor at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Now the area that he spoke about had no, or taught on had nothing to do with, with happiness. But he said more <laughs> I have been following you in Huffington Post. And he said, I'm a cancer survivor. He said, I was supposed to be dead. And he said, so I thought, well, what am I going to do but read some happy content? And he said, that was how I found you. And when I learned you were going to be in New York speaking, I wanted to come and say hello. And I was so thrilled to meet him, to know that some of what I was writing about was touching people that I never knew existed. And I'll give you, if I have a moment, Kathy, I'll give you one more story that was equally amazing to me. A few months ago, I was invited to speak at the first summit of 100 young leaders of Southeastern Europe, and the event was in Serbia. And there happened to be a woman who found me through LinkedIn and my comp and my writings again on how do we live happy and authentic lives from the inside out. And uh, she worked in law enforcement, a very high level in Bosnia Herzegovina. Well, when I arrived at the conference in Serbia, she showed up. She took time off from work, left her husband with the four-year-old child that she was, you know, responsible for. And she said, Maura, I wanted to meet you in person. And I thought, my goodness, as a little girl, I remember looking up in the sky at airplanes that were flying above. And all I could think about was, where are they going what other countries are they going to and how can I meet these people in new places? And when I think that after my retirement from the computer industry and from what would be more of a mainstream job, that I could have created this new vocation that was in my heart from the time I was a child that involved meeting new people, sharing ideas about how we can live happily from the inside out and lives that really are meaningful for us. And I I put it all together, and here I am meeting various people, traveling, having fun, and using the equivalent of a new typewriter. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. That's right. It is like a typewriter, only now we also have voice. Right. No which you said you have a podcast. What's the name of the podcast? Uh, well, believe it or not, it's my name, Maura Sweeney, and it's Living Happy Inside Out. And in my podcast, they're very different from most others because they're usually under 10 minutes in length. And I will come up with one reflective question to ask the listener. Do you know how most of us when we're growing up, um, we're not usually asked for our opinion. 
we're oftentimes not asked what's important to us or what our values are like. And maybe sometimes we forgot to ask ourselves, well, as I get these questions, I throw them into a podcast. And so it gives the <laughs> listeners a chance to say, wait a minute. Am I really enjoying what I'm doing over here? Is this purchase that I just made something that I wanted or was somebody selling it to me? So I ask little questions like that. It's fun for me. It's natural for me. And obviously, there's a listenership somewhere that it's it's meeting a need for. That's great. So that's an addition to your blog. And what do you talk about on your blog? Oh, the blogs can cover so many topics. I'll give you, when, I, when you said, how often do I put things on Huffington? The last or most recent um, post I did for Huffington was all about the skeletons in our closet. And I love to talk about things that involve emotional intelligence. So in this case, um, I actually had a video done um, Last summer, it would have been August or September when I was on the campus of Yale University. Have you ever heard of Skull and Bones Society? I have. Yeah. Well, my husband and I happened to step on the campus, and I love visiting new places. And I looked and I thought, oh, what is that building that has no windows to it? It just looked odd. And we both realized and found out it was Skull and Bones. I said, oh, do me a favor. I need to ask this reflective question on a video. Well, Kathy, I had that video since August, and I didn't get the inspiration to put it together into a blog until a few weeks ago. And I submitted it to Huffington, and out of all places, they ended up submitting it or putting it onto their collegiate page. So I never know where I'm going to show up. I never know when things will happen. But in this case, to answer your question, here I was just looking at something that caught my attention. And it was the Skull and Bone Society, a place that houses many movers and shakers. And yet there were things done supposedly behind closed doors. And the very question I was asking all of my readers, as I even asked myself, if all of the skeletons were going to fall out of my closet, would I be as judgmental or as difficult um, or as critical of other people as if I were, if they were always hidden? And so you could see, I go into these various questions that help people see their neighbor as themselves and themselves as their neighbor. And in the process, hopefully break down some barriers that we keep between ourselves and others, but also help us to grow in ways that make our internal life a little bit more peaceful and unified. So it shows up in so many different ways. But that one on the skull and bones, it's like here I, did, I was on the campus in, in August and didn't get the actual concept for a blog until a few weeks ago. That sounds like a spiritual component of your writings. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I always call myself a hybrid because some people say, wow, Maura, you know, you're a little bit woo-woo. But then I, I've got the business piece. I'm a little bit of an artist. I love to travel. So I, I probably weave together various elements that are natural for me and they create somehow my own brand. But do you know, you now we're talking to people who are either in retirement or contemplating retirement. And I always encourage other people to think in similar fashion. There's no other you than you. So think about what your training has been in, what your interests are, and what those curiosities are that you have that are maybe uniquely you and put them together in ways that suit you. And, and typically they make us happy but they also help contribute in unique ways to the world around us. I love that. And I love, love, love what you write about. I love the fact that you have this 10-minute podcast. I, I can't wait to listen to it. It sounds just up my alley. And it also sounds like that podcast that you offer will help some of my own retirees, some of my listeners who are stuck in their own lives. So thank you so much for for having that. So we are going to start wrapping up the show, Maura. And there's always two questions that I ask my guests, whether they're retirees. And I consider you sort of a hybrid. You're a retiree, but you are also an author. Right, right. And I, I just happen to love doing what I'm doing. So it's a vocation that's really becoming another career. Exactly. So I, I love that about you. You kind of see both sides. You're still doing things, but in effect, you're actually retired because you don't have to work. You're working because it's what you love. So what would you tell people 
who are thinking about retirement, what one piece of advice would you give somebody to know before they retire? I'd love to use the word values or value system. As I referenced before, a lot of us get so caught up in life that we're answering to a lot of responsibilities and a lot of messaging that we get from society or whatever around us. People who are ready to retire would do very well to say to themselves, what are my values? Meaning, what's really important to me? And sometimes that process is the very thing we need to do to help us get from where we've been living to where we really want to live in a way that feels good, natural, authentic, and happy for us. Because maybe, Kathy, what I like may not be what someone who's listening today enjoys doing. You know, I love traveling, but other people would say, well, Maura, I don't want to be on 15-hour bus rides, you know, as you're traveling around the globe. I want to travel at the Ritz. But find out whatever your value system is and then look for ways to craft your life according to those values and look at retirement as a time in your life where you can be your best and and most authentic self. And it comes really from asking yourself a question like that. What are my values? Great advice. The second question is, what if you're talking to a retiree who's been retired for a little while and maybe hasn't done what you said, didn't think about their values, and now they feel stuck in their life? What is the one piece of advice that you would give that retiree to help get them unstuck? Well, the first thing I would just say, do not despair and don't get down on yourself. I think a lot of us do that. You know, we're very hard on ourselves. I have a little exercise that I encourage people to do all the time when they're trying to get back in touch with that GPS on the inside of them that says, this is who I really am. And what I encourage them to do is close their eyes when they're on their own, put their hand um, on their chest below their collarbone, almost as if they're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance, but a little higher. And the reason why I say to do that is because in that moment when you put your hand there, you move the attention away from the intellect, which is all of your former training. It's that monkey mind that's constantly going around saying, ah. Oh, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. And once they do that, close their eyes, put their hand on their um, on their chest below their collarbone. Just go back and think about their early years, growing up, maybe even before school started, before the world told them what they could or could not do, and have them survey some fun times in life. And the moment that they arrive on a memory that causes their mouth to smile, stop right there. Because therein, in that memory, would be something they were doing, playing with, thinking about, imagining, creating. That really it has something to do so closely with their heart and with their passions. And they may be many decades older. They may not be able to do things the same way that they would have imagined them as a child, but there is a link in those things that made them smile as children that if they continue to pull upon that little strand and find ways to interact with it, they will connect with what makes them happy and they will find new life in it. And if I can just give an example to make it easier to understand, Kathy, I told you when I was little, I was brought up to be a lawyer, but I told you I was really a free spirit. I wanted to dance. That's what I wanted to do. I saw American Bandstand. I thought, oh, these kids look like they're having so much fun. I want to dance. And instead, I had to learn the piano. Do you know when I started learning how to dance? At age 50. It was so hard for me and everything in me said, oh, I can't dance. Yeah, I'd have to be a five-year-old in a tutu to learn how to dance. <laughs> I enrolled in college. I failed the course twice. I had people laughing at me. But Kathy, I learned how to do the steps. I learned how to connect with the joy that was within me. I dropped a lot of mental baggage. I didn't let go of the thing that I knew had life in it for me. So believe it or not, learning how to dance and ending up performing on stage started me in my first book, in my book series, which is called The Art of Happiness. And I called it uh, 
exiting the comfort zone, dance or die. So to any listener today, they may say, oh, I can't do what I loved as a child because they're thinking about those things in only one context. But as you exercise your mind and your imagination and find ways to connect with it, you will find a way that's meaningful for today. So I'm not going to be on Dancing with the Stars, nor am I going to be a rockette. But I'll tell you what I am today. I dance in a local flash mob group. I love that. So do you see, that's my story, but there is a similar story or a parallel life story for anyone who has uh, gotten themselves into their own rut. The only thing is don't give up. Just keep up with it, whatever that it may be, and it will materialize for you over time. Maybe there's hope for me because I have two less feet, but I love to dance too. And I'm 50, so maybe I'll I'll follow after you and take a class and learn how to dance. Join a flash. Yes, yes. <laughs> Kathy, if I may, can I offer a free gift to your listeners? That would be fabulous. Tell us what it is. It's the very book. It's on Amazon and they're only 99 cent fo- books. But if any one of your listeners would like to read the story that will invite them to exit their own comfort zone and give them some food for thought, they can ha- write me Mora at moraforyou.com and ask for a free copy of Exiting the Comfort Zone or the Day dance book and they will laugh their way through it because it's like a bad episode of I Love Lucy that has a happy ending and people have read the little book it's easy reading and they said my goodness Maura if you could learn how to dance I could become president of the United States tomorrow because it was that hard for me to learn and yet it gave me such joy and happiness at the end well I hope my listeners take you up on that your email address is Maura at M A U R a, the number four, the letter U dot com. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And your website is www dot mora for you dot com as well. And that's the number four and the letter U, correct? Right, right, right. And the reason why it was Mora for you, my husband gave me that name. He said, Mora, I've never seen a proponent for other people or an advocate for others like you are. He said, you're for everybody. So why not call your site Mora for you, whoever you may be? What a wonderful story. Mora, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And I know my listeners will too. And for our listeners, thank you for listening. And don't forget to subscribe to the show. If you need to know how to do that, you can go to the website, rockyourretirement.com. We'll see you next time on Rock Your Retirement. Thanks for listening to the Rock Your Retirement show. If you are rocking your retirement or know someone who would make a great guest on our show, please send us an email at podcast at rockyourretirement.com. Hi, this is Kathy. When I'm not hosting Rock Your Retirement, I'm helping people with their Medicare insurance. One of the times you need to check your Medicare insurance is when you've moved. To get my free guide, Five Things You Need to Know About Medicare When You're Moving, just go to medicarequick.com slash move. And in the meantime, listen to these cool disclosures. Neither Medicare Quick nor its agents is connected with the federal Medicare program. Medical insurance licensed in the states of California, Florida, Nevada, and Texas, and Medicare Advantage and Prescription Drug Plan service areas vary. California Insurance License 0797566.